So we call this one Building a Better Scorecard. Before we roll into it, a little bit about me, a lot of you know me, a lot of you are clients, um, lifelong entrepreneur and business consultant, founder and president of, of Cruise & Co., our consulting company, and also a company called CE Painting, both who are on the Inc. 5000 list this year. CE Painting, uh, actually two years ago, almost broke the Inc. 500. I think we got something like number 570 on the list. Um, both are organic growth companies uh, are financed with <coughs> our own our own cash. And our companies do a, a re to total revenue close to $20 million <clears throat> with around a 70-ish headcount. So that's kind of where our businesses uh, are right now. I used to own a company called Collegiate Entrepreneurs Painting Services, <clears throat> which I recently sold to a longtime general manager who may even be here today, and which was also an Inc. 5000 company multiple times. I owned the company for almost 20 years and had almost 11,000 employees during that time frame. Uh, it was quite a ride. So in my time as an entrepreneur, I've had a lot of employees and done a lot of scorecarding. And I have had experience with all types of scorecards, departmental, senior level, uh, uh, great scorecards, bad scorecards, evolved scorecards. Um, so I've kind of seen it all in terms of scorecards. I was an EOS implementer for eight years uh, before starting our firm. Um, I loved my time there. If any of you are using EOS as a system, uh, EOS certainly has scorecards as part of their system, as do we. Hopefully, if you're using that system, some of this will help you. Uh, and and while I was an EOS implementer, and and including that time and today, I've done over 1,000 session days with our clients. Uh, but a few years ago, I started I started the firm. So I went from delivering uh, work directly for clients to actually starting a firm, and we built Cruise & Co. We now work with over 100 and 105 to 110 companies across the United States and into Canada. And yes, for some Europeans who might be here, some in Europe as well. Uh, our mission is we help entrepreneurs and their teams live their ideal lives. Our goal is to become the Deloitte for small and medium-sized businesses. We really are just formed to help entrepreneurs because I am an entrepreneur. Uh, I want to help entrepreneurs as much as I can. And we want to help entrepreneurs uh, to really uh, have the resources that they, that especially small and medium businesses just don't get. Our niche is helping entrepreneurs specifically to increase revenue, profitability, and valuation. So when you work with our firm, we're focusing on those three things. We focus on a lot of stuff to achieve that, but ultimately, uh, those are the numbers we actually track. All right, I don't see market. the slides. Oh, you can't see it? Oh, no. thank you, Ms. Nicolette. <laughs> Nicolette. That's only because I didn't share the deck. That's <laughs> There you go. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything else I'm missing? Can you see me? I hope so. I can see you, yes. Okay. Thank you, Nicolette. Brandon's also chatting me. All right. So our target market, small and medium-sized businesses from a million dollars up to 999 employees. Um, we do focus on small and medium-sized companies, and we have a very large uh, uh, swath of both. We focus on both markets. Our value proposition we have really three things that we focus on delivering to our clients. One, we have a whole company operating system. So we have an operating system that gets that gets senior leaders, all departments on the same page. We work with companies actually every level of the business if they want us to. But in our operating system, we're, we're really passionate that you use it in the entire company from top to bottom, which is why scorecards is so important. We do hold, hold ourselves accountable to your results and your success. Um, we do lean in pretty heavily on that. And we have a lot of the resources that you might need along your entrepreneurial journey. So this is why our clients um, uh, use us usually as one of those three reasons. Now, we have a finance company that's separate, uh, runs separately, but is also a part of our team. We work with M&A partners, recruiting partners. Um, uh, really, we have resources, all the resources that entrepreneurs need to help scale their businesses. Okay, so we're going to dive into what's a scorecard, why does it matter, how to structure and use a scorecard, and choosing the right metrics for your scorecard. Okay. So really those three things, what is it, why does it matter, how to structure and how to use it and choosing the right metrics for your scorecard. Now, before I roll into all this, I'm gonna tell you one statement that I hope frames this whole thing for you. There's really no such thing as a bad scorecard, okay? Uh, and I say that having seen a bunch of bad scorecards including our own at times. So, but don't worry about it. There, it, it score, do not, with scorecards, the number one thing I want you to learn in this is do not let perfection be the enemy of good enough. Just track stuff. That being said, I'm going to try and dive in help how you can take that, what you have now, whether it's bad or you consider it good, whatever it is, and make it better. 
but do not worry about it, about nailing it. Scorecard is a very iterative journey. So do we actually have a live poll, Nicola? I think we might. Yes, we do. Poll number one, does your company have a scorecard? Take a second if you can answer that question. Does your company have a scorecard? And submit the answer. I'm curious what the answers to this question actually are. For our clients, if you don't have a scorecard, uh, please tell us who your consultant is. We will try to make sure they get fired relatively soon. I'm kidding. It might take us a couple of weeks to get that done, actually. All right. Thank you for submitting your answers. We got some answers all over the board here. Some do, some don't, some kind of in the middle. That's totally common. Remember with scorecards, what gets measured gets done. Okay. You're going to hear a couple of cliches in there. I don't like cliches, but some of them are really important. And this is one of them. If there's something in your business that you're wondering why is this not getting done, what we ask our clients is, why aren't you tracking it? So what you inspect, you get, or whatever that expression is, I don't even know that cliche, but you get this one. If you want to get it done, you're going to have to measure it. All right. It's just the way it is. And too many, too many people blame their team members for, for not doing stuff. And I get it. But if you're the leadership team or you're an owner or whatever you are, you got to carry your own bag on this. If you're not measuring it, then don't expect it to get done. So what's a scorecard? A scorecard is a tool for quantifying and tracking performance inside your organization. Pretty basic stuff. You already know that. And here are some of the scorecard characteristics. It is five to 15 items that put your finger on the pulse of the company. Now, once again, I'm trying to get this thing to be a little more advanced today. So if you already have a scorecard, it's meant to be a little more advanced. Scorecards, you're meant to have a scorecard at every level of your business. If you only have a leadership team and you have people just on that level, that's totally okay. But many of you have other levels. There's a lot of nuances to scorecard. scorecards. If you have a leadership team, that's the only level you have, or you only have one level of people who are meeting weekly, you're probably going to have a little more granularity in your scorecard because you're tracking a lot of uh, what would typically be more departmental metrics. If you have a larger business with multiple levels, you're going to be tracking uh, more broad, broad numbers at the top, okay? But typically, it's five to 15 items, and you have one, one at every level of the business. They are the activities that can be tracked in the business. They are the measurables. Sometimes they're binary. They can be yes or no, but for the most part, they are numbers that can be measured for the most part. There are some exceptions to that. They are achievable under normal circumstances. They are things in your control. I'm going to go through a bunch of examples today so you can see all this. So a scorecard should be something that is achievable. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep diving. Set, they set the bar for a great team member, but not necessarily a superstar uh, or an underperformer. So I get this question a lot. What should the number be? Scorecard numbers, once you figure out what the category is, i.e. a uh, quality metric and an NPS or a... Uh, uh, number of sales calls metric. Once you identify what you want to measure, the actual goal for that measurement should be, um, it should not, be, it should be able to be done without heroics. And probably a lot of you know what I mean by that. Uh, and, and if you have to do, use heroics every week and your team members have to really push themselves to hit it, you're probably by definition not really running a scalable business. You may be running a heroic business. You may actually even be getting, getting done and hitting your numbers, but heroics is kind of the opposite of scalable. And our company focuses on scale. So the number should be something that a superstar, uh, uh, that a non-superstar can hit. These are usually these numbers are usually reported on weekly. Either it's in a, our on-track meeting if we use our system, or if it's an L10 or just a weekly meeting. Usually scorecard metrics are reported weekly. And once again, they're at every level of the business. Let's keep diving in. Why does it matter? So this is from one of our clients. Our current scorecard tells me exactly how the company is performing without any complex analysis. When the scorecard is green, we hit our targets and I'm happy. You should be able to look at your scorecard at every level of the business and know just by looking at it, are we winning or not? It should be that simple. Your employees and your team members should be able to look at your scorecard and answer this important question at the end of every week. Did I win or not? And that's a really important thing that people, people miss. A scorecard is not a gotcha type thing. I get this question a lot. It is not one of those, you're red, you're off for the week, you're done. If that was the case, I wouldn't have any team members. Okay, It's meant to be a helping tool that helps employees, team members, 
see if they're winning on a weekly basis. And if not, we see where we can help them. Sometimes they may, may, may mean moving into a different role or maybe even moving them out of the business. But ideally, we're trying to help them to achieve their numbers. That's the goal. So that's what a scorecard is. And this allows the leadership team to see how are we doing as a whole in our business. If your scorecard is set up correctly, it should quantify your strategy for success. And it'll tell you whether you're actually achieving your business goals. Now, you may hear me say this multiple times today. Your, your scorecard is a representation. It should be a representation of your strategy in action through numbers. Okay. Now, strategy is a webinar that we're going to run at some point because a lot of you don't even know what strategy is. And sometimes I even get fuzzy on what strategy is. Okay. Strategy is a, a term that's so misused. But your business basically has a strategy for growth, it has a strategy for operations. And once you figure out what that strategy is for how you're going to really impress your customers and really increase your revenue, the how you're going to do that, the activities that you're going to use to do that are often quantified in a scorecard. A scorecard creates accountability and allows you to have conversations based on information and not emotion. It takes all that out of it. Emotion is certainly important in a business. You want to have that. You want to, your business should feel like a family and all those great things, which are extremely important for culture, different webinar. But to, this is all about the measurement side of that. How are we actually doing? A scorecard provides the data your company needs to iterate change and make smarter decisions as you grow. So that's kind of the macro goals that we're trying to get done with our scorecard. Is it showing us our strategy in motion? Is it, is it showing our team members how to, how to get it done with their strategy? And I'll show you what that means more in a second. That's by department, by the way. That's by department. Is it creating accountability? And is it giving us the data that we need as we look at it to say, huh, why is this not working? What do we need to be fixing? So it's not a gotcha tool. So out of this section, I just want you to understand it's not a gotcha tool. It may show us that our team members aren't necessarily doing what they're supposed to be doing, but there's a lot of reasons why that could be the case. And this, this little section here is it was a big aha for me as I went through and as I continue to evolve as a business person, because to me, it was always like, oh, you're not getting it done. I got a scorecard now to prove that. If you use scorecard for that, you will fail in your use of scorecards. And I have done that myself and I failed. I have companies that do that. This is not your tool as a senior leadership team to be gotcha for your people. It is a way to empower and excite them to see how they win each week and for you to help them to win so they can get green every week. How to structure and use a scorecard. All right, let's dive in even more. Let's talk about the anatomy of a scorecard. Here's a scorecard. We will provide you the deck, okay? So you're seeing all this stuff and you say, this is good or useful. I wanna have it, we're gonna get it for you. <clears throat> I believe we have this here and we have this at the end as well. We have some a uh, little more different example, little different examples, but we have this in both places. This is a scorecard that encompasses the more leading indicators as well as the lagging indicators. Now, the reason for that, and I'm going to dive into that a little bit more here in a minute, is the real definition, if you go by the true, true, the true scorecard, is that it's stuff that you can control. Okay, so it's stuff that you can control. So at a senior level, so I know some of you may have two or three levels in your business or even two levels in your business i.e. senior leadership and maybe one level below that, whatever numbers are on your scorecard, you should be able to control it. So if you could put a lagging indicator, i.e. a gross profit or a revenue or something or sales numbers, if you can control that on a weekly basis and you can say, I can control that at a senior level, sometimes I'll let that go as, as a scorecard item. Uh, I will then ask, is there more of a detailed scorecard somewhere else in the business that I can look at the activities that drive that because that's really how you're controlling it. So if you're a senior team, you might have more lagging stuff up here if you have multiple levels because you have more of that more detailed stuff. The way you're controlling that stuff is that you have there's more, there's more detail inside the next level down. Okay, so this is an example uh, of a team. Uh, ju just the top part is what I would actually call the scorecard. But you'll notice on this, I put the lagging indicators on the bottom because some people can't handle not having lag, lag indicators on there. But the problem is, and some of you are gonna identify with this, you can't always make lagging indicators green on a weekly basis. And here's the problem. If you put too many items on a weekly, score, on a weekly scorecard that you can't make green, your scorecard 
I call it, it looks more like the ornaments and less like the Christmas tree. You want to look more like a Christmas tree and less like ornaments. I have less ornaments on it. So if you, otherwise it becomes noise and people don't care about making a green because it's so red. So the, 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 the danger of putting lagging indicators and in a scorecard where it has stuff that only you can control is that eventually people don't take it seriously because they're like, there's so much red on here, we don't even care anymore. So you take those lagging indicators, which ideally line up and put them down below. But honestly, not to confuse you, if you do just the top stuff as your part of your scorecard for this slide, you're in good shape. So you can see in the scorecard, this team's identified sales team meetings with targets, uh, target accounts weekly. They have a goal of one per week owned by Rebecca. Notice that the who is on the left, the measurables in the middle, and the goal for every week is here. You'll notice this is set up as a 13-week sprint. We typically run our scorecards in 13-week sprints. Our clients do meetings quarterly. If you don't have a quarterly meeting, I still recommend resetting them every 90 days, even if it's just a one-hour meeting with your team. Why? Because if you're growing, the goal will likely change over time or the names will change. If it's always the same goal every week and you don't add new names or new or, or change the goal one or the other, you're not going to grow your business, right? So a scorecard numbers really should be adjusted or at least the name should be adjusted on a weekly, on a quarterly basis. So this person has new sales qualified leads, weekly targeted two, new logos, 30 day trailing, three. Sometimes I push back on that and I say, how do you control it? In this case, she probably said, I can control new logos uh, and I want to target. And I'd let that go if she says she can control it. So this person did. Chandler, billable utilization, 85%. Once again, I would ask, can you control that? The answer is yes. I'm going to allow that to go. The answer is I can't control it. I'm going to say, or there's not more detail on somebody else's scorecard. I'm going to say it doesn't fly because the goal is to make it green. Speak with new investors. This person, Steve, has a goal of one new investor per week. So you can see this team, uh, I'm not sure what, this is probably, this may be a, this is probably a senior leadership team for a smaller business is probably what this is. Because you'll see kind of some departmentally kinds of things in here and also some bigger picture things in here. If I had to guess, I can look at this and tell you this is probably a 20 or 30 person company, all right? Because uh, once again, as you take some of these measurements and you get bigger, some of these measurements might go just into the sales uh, team scorecard, not on the senior team scorecard. So when you have, if you have just a senior leadership team scorecard, you tend to have more stuff on there because you're not tracking it anyplace else. This is kind of probably in the middle. Notice on this one throughout the week, it tends to get green towards the end of the quarter. That happens a lot. Um, I chalk it up to good old procrastination, actually. I mean, this is pretty well done, Nicolette. Nice job on the slide. This is not uncommon. You know, it's ide ideally you hit every single week on your numbers, but after a quarter, often you see the first week or two being missed. It's not ideal, but the reason we break it into 13 week sprints is because we just, if, you, if you broke it into a year, you get really lazy. So we break it into 30, 13 week sprints. It's, it's, you get really focused and you can really nail it when you do that. And then just to keep our sanity, you'll notice down here, we have some lagging indicators just to look at. You'll notice a red. I don't really care if you make these red or green, if you're gonna put lagging indicators on there, but I do like this. So if you can pull this off, good for you. They're measuring gross margin. They're measuring pro-tax net profit. You certainly can't control that on a weekly basis, but they wanna see it. And they do new managed services. For the size of company this likely is, this is a pretty darn good scorecard. Now, this is better than our consulting scorecard, by the way. So if you look at this and like, I don't do that. Yeah, either do we. This is like really, really good. In fact, Brendan, fix it. Our, we need to make ours as good as this one. Okay. That is a really good scorecard. All right. So if you get, want some examples of that, you want to see it. When you get this deck, you'll see that. All right. So measurables are the activities being tracked. I think we have five of them on here. No, we got four. Okay. So measurables are activities being tracked. I'm going to give you a bunch of smaller ones in a few minutes. This is just some high level stuff. Gross profit, if you can control it. Number of calls made in a week, quality rating, if you're measuring it weekly, or you can do trailing. Some people say, well, I can only measure it once a month. I get that question a lot. What do I do? Try trailing four week average. Try last four weeks average. Um, or you can do um, tra tra trailing four or something like that. If it's binary, sometimes you can use yes or no. Uh, I don't love yes or no. You should only have one of those, maybe out of every 20 or 30 measurables. Um, number referrals, you know, I'm going to give you, this is, I'm going to give you a much bigger list here in a minute. Here we go. Here's the stuff. 
I'm going to see if I can get all these. We have even more coming soon. You'll get all of these in the deck when you get it. But here they are. Here's this is so once again, if you have four or five departments, some of you I know do because you're you're scaling, then you're going to have four or five different scorecards at every level. They're doing weekly meetings and they might break down like this. You have one leadership team. You're going to have more of these types of variables on yours because you're kind of controlling things at a small group. There's no good or bad there. Bigger is not always better. So in this company, sales, sales calls, touches, sales presentation, proposals, close ratio, new lead generated. You can control those. Operations, profit, inventory percentage. Uh, profit, I would say, is potentially lagging. Inventory percentage is a great one if you have inventory. Number of errors, utilization rates, overtime, awesome. If you have a problem with that, number of complaints, it's usually bi it's usually binary or it's a one or a two per week uh, or something like that. Um, marketing, names added to the mailing list, likes, followers on social media, number of posts, number of events, finance, AR greater than 60 cash balance errors, employee satisfaction surveys. Once again, what measurables should you use? You want to think about the senior level. What strategy are we pushing? What's our strategy for operations? How do we make operations nail it? How do we nail our strategy for revenue? and then track the variables that are most important for you to be nailing the strategy used for growing your company, making your customers love you and making money while you do it. I know this is a lot. So like I said, I'll stop you at the end for questions or you can always ping us. Okay, just some review items here. I'm gonna go through with you one at a time. Just gonna put them all on the screen so you can see them. We'd like to make sure you read the scorecard every single week in your leadership meeting, very important, okay? This is what's happening every week. This is how you do your scorecard review. If the numbers are hit, you make it green. Little tip for you. Before you do your weekly meeting, whether it's a huddle, whether it's an OTM, if you're one of our clients or an L10 meeting or whatever you're, or a weekly meeting, if you call it that, have people before they come to that meeting, update their numbers in advance of the meeting, have them color the cell red or green so that when you do your meeting, you can do a scorecard review extremely quick. Five minutes is all you need for a weekly scorecard review. And you write down any issues on a piece of paper that come out of that review. But the exercise of making somebody put their number in once a week and make it red or green is, is a, an extra nugget of accountability that helps them to win. If the numbers are missed, scorecard item is red, red for the week. You want scorecards green at least 80% of the time. That is the standard. Okay. Don't let a red scorecard go unaddressed. Either confirm the person who missed their target has it under control or Drop it to your challenges and opportunities list or on a notepad or whatever you do, if you're small or large or a Google Doc or Asana, whatever you're doing, just record the fact that we have an issue so you can discuss it. So your weekly scorecard review is meant to be a moment of accountability. And I'll, I'll give you one more minute further here. I have them read the item. Greg, number of meetings, I hit one. My goal was two, red. Brendan, I had to do uh, this many calls. I did four. I was supposed to do six. Red. Uh, number of surveys for customers this week. Nicolette owns it. I was supposed to do six. I did eight. Green. Uh, and so forth and so forth. I have them read it one at a time. If it's red, I say issue. No, under control. Next one, issue. No, under control. An item can stay in the scorecard red for three or four weeks sometimes. If there's a plan to get it resolved, I move on. If I, as the leader of my department, am not confident there's a plan, I'm going to write it down and say, I'm not confident there's a plan to make that green. But sometimes people look at their, they look, or they'll see my meetings and they'll see a whole red scorecard and say, why aren't you addressing some of these things? And I'll say, because they're already addressed. The solution just has not kicked in yet. And some solution, some things can be read for, a for months at a time. Now, if it goes on for quarters at a time, I would say your plan's not working. So you really should still be hitting 80% of the numbers, but sometimes things might be read for a while. But don't be slack about it. You have to go through every one, or you're it's like kids. If you don't stay on it, you're gonna have you're gonna start to get some chinks in your armor and you're gonna lose accountability. That's why five to 15 is the general rule. Our consulting company has 20. I looked through it earlier and I actually if I have time, I'll show you ours today. Um, we have 20 on ours, but you know, we've been a scaling consulting company for only three years now. I would say our scorecard's about a B minus, and we're trying to make it an A. It takes time. It'll be 15. We're also adding new team members, which can make it bigger sometimes. Uh, my goal is we'll be at 12 to 15 metrics in the next six to 12 months is my bet. So, but you're talking the person does this for a living and I still have 50, I still have 20, 20 variables and I'm still giving us a B minus. 
but I got to let it marinate a little bit. So we're not doing great with it, but we are doing it and it's getting a little bit better every quarter. So that's how we do our weekly review. So now let's get to the heart of it. So why can a scorecard actually be read? Well, there's a lot of reasons a scorecard can be read. Uh, and this is certainly not meant to be an all encompassing list. Um, it, it could be the wrong person. Uh, Nicolette for the future, make that one fourth actually, because everybody thinks that's always the number one. It is not. As I told a group this morning, I would say about 20, 25% of the time, the issue with the number is actually the person, about 25% of the time. And that's tops. It may be less than that, actually. Oftentimes, it's the wrong metric. This happens especially in the first year to year and a half. It's been, at some point, you're like, this is stupid. Why are we tracking this? Well, then take it off. But at least start with something that's stupid before, and rather than doing nothing. You might have the wrong assumptions or be trying to measure the wrong thing, or you could be wrong measuring the wrong number. So you might say, that's the right measurable, but it's the wrong number. And that's why we're losing. So then you tweak the number and you got to be careful because those numbers are, are actually your business model, right? So you kind of got to be careful as you tweak these numbers. And we have this in our consulting company. Sometimes if I say, well, tweak the number and then our CFO will look at it and say, well, that's nice that you tweak the number, Eric, but our business model just broke by you doing that. Like that doesn't actually work. That may be realistic. But we have a bigger problem because that means we're actually going to fail long-term. So capacity, not enough staff or capacity. This happens. That's when you're usually requiring a person to do heroics doesn't scale very well. I'm not saying heroics is not a plan for a short period of time. It just can't be a period for a, a, a solution for a longer period of time. Unforeseen issues, market changes, outliers, hiccups. Uh, you know, hopefully this is helping you because this is all stuff I had to learn. Before I had learned all this stuff, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, a scorecard read, I'd just say, oh, you got, you, you obviously stink. Like, that's the problem. It's your scorecard. You missed the ball. You took a swing. You missed. You lose. Like, that's the problem. So then I've learned, like, that's no, you can't run a company like that. That's making the assumption it's always your employee's issue. And that's not the case. So you want to dive in. What's the real problem? Is it one of these things here? You're going to really beat people up for, uh, you know, certain numbers if the, if the economy's down. Um, that's a whole other webinar for a different day. You got to be careful. You got to make sure your scorecard is set up to match the times of where you are so you don't kill people. And you got to make sure it's realistic. And if your strategy is that to be flat and to and to and to be or to hold in any category, your scorecard should reflect that. Otherwise, your people are just going to be demoralized. So this is some of the reasons the scorecards can go red. But as you saw in the last slide, when you review it every week, you just got to make sure you're relentless, you don't give up, and you ask, what's the real problem we're dealing with here? Okay. The root cause of a red scorecard will drive the next step you take to fix it. So really, we don't leave the scorecard review every week until we're confident that every one of those numbers is either being addressed through a plan or in our weekly meeting, we are then going to address it. Now, as a reminder for our clients, and some of them forget this, our OTM stands for on-track meeting, our weekly meeting. Uh, EOSers might use an L L10 if you're doing that. So on-track meeting, uh, the on part, stands for objectives, because we use OKRs, objectives and numbers. So the things you're supposed to be addressing first in your weekly meetings and your OTMs, you're supposed to be addressing your objectives that are off track first, and then your numbers. So this is where you should be talking is if your numbers are off track, your business is off track. Let's figure out how to choose the right metrics here. I'm not going to do this in the interest of time. Is your scorecard leading the results you're trying to achieve? I'm betting you're, that the answer would be 50-50. That's my bet. And some of you who are nailing it probably are saying 75 or 80% of the time it is. Maybe some of you are lucky to beat 100. Usually it's 50-50. Uh, if you're anywhere between 25 and 50% right now of numbers, uh, getting the, or having the right numbers on your scorecard, I'd say that's pretty darn good, honestly. In our consulting scorecard, I believe we have probably 50 to 60% of the numbers are getting us to where we want to go. The other 40% are still, I'm glad we're tracking them, but they're very questionable to me. They probably won't survive. They're good for where we are in our journey now, but they need to change, okay? So give yourself some permission to once again, do some iteration. Okay, what makes a good measurable in the first place? So the measurable, once again, is not the number, that's the goal. The measurable is the thing you're measuring itself. It has to meaningfully affect the business, one person can be accountable for it only. You cannot have multiple people. The best, it's, the best thing I ever heard about this is from a, a gentleman who told me this. He was absolutely right. He said, at the end of the day, you should visualize yourself standing at the exit to your office, back when everybody used to go to work, 
and your employees would, would file out of the office and they would sell you their scorecard as they walked out and they would say, I own this number and this number and I hit it, I hit it. You'd give them a high five and they'd go celebrate their weekend. So every single person needs a number and, and they have to be accountable. So it's, it's their individual scorecard. Now you might have the same measurable on 20 people's scorecards, especially if you have a sales team or an ops team that's you know with a bunch of account managers on it. They may have the same number, but they only can be accountable for their number. It's an activity to control rather than a result. You've already heard that five times. I know the rule of thumb is seven. You'll probably hear two more knowing us in the slide deck. Remember that there, so I added this. That's the reason there's a typo. I added this today, Nicolette. Remember that there are likely different levels of scorecards in your business. This is a really important thing, once again, for, uh, for people that run different size businesses. So if you look at your scorecard, or this is for our consulting team, I know a bunch of you are here, and you're like, well, some of these look like they're more lagging. Some of these, some things on a scorecard might look more lagging if you only have one level. Uh, and even if you have a, if you don't have a sales team, but you have a sales leader, which happens a lot, or you don't have an ops, an ops management team, you just have an ops leader, you might even consider only having the top most important metrics on the weekly meeting scorecard for your senior team. You may even have a separately broken out scorecard for sales, for example, because sometimes you're tracking 10 to 15 things. So you may only want to track one or two things on your senior dash, your senior scorecard. And then you can even have a separate scorecard that's just your sales metrics, even if you don't have a leadership mean or another management team for that level, just because it, otherwise your scorecard gets too busy. That's kind of a big takeaway. This is That's an advanced takeaway. But just because you don't have more departments, I don't want you to have 15 scorecard metrics on your weekly meeting. It's It's too much noise. Just say the most important sales metrics are these two. I have a deeper dive scorecard over here that's also weekly, and I'll let you all see those numbers if you want to. But sales operations team doesn't always want to see, even with a small team, that you have your 10 sales metrics on track. Pick your higher level, most important one or two, and put the other ones on a different scorecard. I know that's higher level. If you have questions, email us. More measurables. You've already seen those. How do you determine the right targets for your scorecard? That's what we're trying to ultimately get. Okay, everybody see that again? I just want you to see what it ultimately looks like. It can vary by level. One more time. That's what we're trying to ultimately get to. That's the end in mind. How do you get there? It starts with trial and error. Okay. So this stuff here is where people really start to kind of, you can screw it up. If you need help with this, by the way, we'll probably give you an hour on this at no cost. We'll, we'll, we'll just do it. Whether you become a client or not, or if you are a client, then you, you want another set of eyes on it. Just email us and we'll put you with somebody else to give you another set of eyes on your scorecard. You got to start with trial and error. A good scorecard can take as long as two years to build. We're in year three. I'm a little tough. Ours is probably a B minus. It's probably more like a B plus, but it's not where I, I'd like it to go. And we're almost three years into our journey at, at scaling size. A good scorecard is a 90 day sprint. You want to examine, update the goals in the scorecard every quarter. What worked, what didn't work, reevaluate, stick with it for 13 weeks unless there's a huge misfire. So I'm going to show you in the next slide, I believe, how you build this thing. But I want you to remember perfection is the enemy of good enough. And I want you to know that when we do the next slide, I would just want you to stick with it for 90 days, okay? Just stick with it for 90 days. Or if you already are doing that, then just keep iterating it. Measurables don't change once you've found the right ones, okay? Our commercial painting company measures about six or seven key variables. It's one of the fastest growing companies we that we work with. It's our company. It's really fast growing company. It's, it's because of its simplicity that it grows so quickly. And we focus on six or seven measurables only. That's really it. And they have not changed. It's the most boring company ever. The value should likely change every quarter if you want to grow your business. Expectations should set the baseline for the role. Not an underperforming employee, not a superstar once again. And ask yourself, can somebody in my company make this green every single week? So here you go. Here's how you do it. We're not going to ask you for a volunteer. I got 20 minutes left. I want to give you a few minutes for questions. 
It's a really simple question. This is pretty much how all of us do it in the industry. If you're on a desert island. What numbers do you need to see on a sheet of paper to know your company's doing okay? That's really it. Same thing for every department. Write down the key measurables you think are most important in the business. And you start by assigning an owner for each one. This is the very basic stuff. You saw that in a previous scorecard uh, webinar for us. The exercise is still the same. It doesn't change. And it's still the same as you iterate your scorecard as well. So ask yourself, are these truly the metrics we want to see, the measurables we want to see at this level every single week? That's all you got to do. That's where you start. And then it iterates and iterates and iterates using a lot of tips you've talk, we've talked about today. All right, now I'm going to get, show you this whole slide and then I'm going to go backwards a little bit and talk to you about a little bigger concept. Your scorecard will eventually contain one to three indicators that truly drive the business forward. Uh, these are leading indicators. <clears throat> this is a big concept, okay? So when I work with a company, including ours, we have 20 measurables. If I pulled our scorecard up and showed it to you, there are probably only four or five things on there that truly drive the business at a rapid rate. And you got to know what those things are. So even though we say you can have up to 15, you got to ask yourself, what are the four or five things or one to three things that are absolute must every week that we have to look at in order to crush it at every level of our business? I'm not saying it just has to be those things. But you've got to know what those things are, because if you can figure out what those things are, you will scale your business. So I was on the phone with uh, Derek, our, our wealth manager partner this morning. We were on a Zoom call and he was talking about getting his clients into meetings. They do fantastic with their uh, their reviews of their clients and they want to make sure those get scheduled. And that there's no lag time around when they get scheduled, because otherwise their clients um, don't get the information they need. They're not happy. So he's identified that as being a, a very key customer service metric for him that drives his entire customer service function. So you got to figure out what are our one, two, three, or four, maybe five at every one of these scorecards that are the absolute crucial ones. You can have a few more, but you got to figure that out. This is a perfect one, three asks per week. So you realize at the base of our, at the base of our business, we need to get a certain number of sales. How do we get those sales in this business? They say asks, whatever that is. It could be a touch. It could be anything. Once that process becomes predictable, you're measurable. Once you figure out that what that what that measure what that process is that you're doing, that becomes your weekly measurable. Okay. So we have this, and uh, we have we count business dinners and lunches in our commercial painting company. Uh, we count number of sixty meeting, meeting, meetings done in our consulting business. There's like a few of these key metrics that we track that we've got to nail or growth stops. The difference between companies scaling, and growing and not is often they just don't know what those numbers are. So people tell me their scorecards off. Yes, sometimes they just don't know any of this stuff or they need some help or whatever they need. 90% of the time though, the scorecard is not the problem. The scorecard is they actually don't know how to, how to run their business. They don't know what these key measurements are. And I'm gonna say you need to have them in three areas. I don't think this is actually one of our slides and we're in the home stretch here. Our three, the three measure, the three variables, the three areas you need to make sure are covered on your scorecard are around sales, something that measures sales, something that measures your performance, like your operations performance, customer satisfaction or errors or something like that. And you have to measure something that covers profitability. I tend to favor gross margin or overtime or utilization or something like that. Some people think those are lagging. I say you're probably right. I just don't even really care. You have to track them somewhere on a weekly basis because that's where you'll lose your money. Uh, it's not usually, you know, the, it's it's in indirect costs. It's in indirect costs like direct costs like that. So revenue, GP, et cetera, lag indicator still valuable, but not driving in most cases. Not all numbers belong on your scorecard. Use a month review. Look at the important numbers related to sales production. You can put them below. You've already seen that. You saw the stuff below that's more lagging. And the stuff up top is the actual leading stuff. All right, home stretch, executive level scorecard only. Okay, so this is an example of an executive level scorecard. Uh, now, oops, sorry about that. This is the executive level scorecard. Now, you might look at this and say, how can that possibly be an executive level scorecard? So this one actually, this one could actually almost be used by a commercial painting company. We are very similar to this. 
you could probably use this in its purest sense to companies that are, you know, I'd say 20, 30 million dollars. Look at what this scorecard tells you. It tells it covers uh it covers everything but but profitability. So this covers it covers sales, it covers operations, doesn't cover if we had a GP on this, Nick let I'd add GP on this for next time. If we had a GP on this, a little bit lagging, but I'd still add it. You probably can run the entire company off these numbers. This company strategy is to do a certain number of calls which are followed by a certain number of pitch meetings and proposals, then they win deals. If they can deliver it on time at 95%, uh, they're good to go. Now, this is a senior scorecard. This is a senior scorecard. So on time delivery uh, could have another scorecard below this, which could be the stuff like Derek was talking about, which is setting up meetings with, with clients. It could be um, uh, uh, it could be a lot of stuff. But you're, it, it, there could be more of a strategy behind that but I will tell you in this company's case, as long as their costs are under control, measuring these six things, they're probably a scaling business, actually. This is probably a scaling business. This is the most simplistic business ever, if you can get your numbers down to this. Um, and most people think that when they get larger, they're like, I need something more sophisticated. And my answer is usually sophistication does not scale very well. Simplicity does. Uh, and, and I really don't like sophistication at a high level on a scorecard. It's really not good. Um, I like it on the lower levels because that's where the uh, the donuts tend to get made. But on the senior level, I like it to be as simple as possible because you can't hide. The simpler the numbers are, the less you can hide. And this is an example of a very simple scorecard. And then we threw in the, the lagging. Oh, Nicolette, look at that. She actually threw it in there. She threw in revenue, gross profit, and referrals. I had no faith. So here you go. This you could you could run a, a very large business off of this one. Now you may take off closed and one deals at a certain size, maybe maybe ten million or maybe even five to eight million. You might take off proposal sent. I wouldn't take off weekly calls though. So uh, I tend to be a little more micro of a CEO, even on a larger size. Uh, I'd probably leave weekly calls on there. I might even leave pitch meetings. Probably leave on time delivery errors caught by. QA, I'd probably leave that on there. I'd leave GP, and then that'd probably be about it. So as your company evolves and evolves and evolves, and the levels below evolve and evolve and evolve, and you may have one, two, or three levels of scorecards, this the one at the top should look real simple because this is just telling me how what our strategy is for growth. Now, if I need to do M and A as part of my strategy, I'll put on there meet with investors. I might add that on there, and sometimes measurables come and go. So M and A is part of my strategy. I might say meet with X number of, of target people. Um, or I might to, to purchase. Um, but for the most part, this is a really simple, probably rep type business um, that, you know, you can't hide in that company. Okay, this is an example of a departmental cascade. We're almost done, almost a question time. This, this is an example of a departmental cascade. This is the top level stuff going into sales and ops. So you'll notice at the top level, once again, this is for a bigger business. You got revenue up top, gross profit, closed in one deals, on-time delivery. Um, it's on there twice for some reason. Then, then sales breaks into weekly calls, pitch meetings, proposals sent, referrals. Ops breaks it into errors caught by QA, on-time delivery, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So, you, But at the top, you just have that super easy one. It's the super basic metric, uh, set of scorecard items that you're looking at. But in this case, you might have two other scorecards, and they're usually got more variables on it than these four. We're just showing you to keep it simple. But you can see this is a cast. This is cascading, and I want to say it again: uh, if you're using us in, in um, our growth method in our system, you um, we're going to pseudo require you get this out to every single person in your company. Every single person in your company has a scorecard, and this is an example of what it looks like at the top, and then how you cascade it so you get through the entire company. Departmental scorecards roll up to executive level scorecard. Executive level scorecard can now track more lagging indicators. And that's how the evolution goes as you scale. Smaller, leading and lagging tend to smash together. Or, or you can put them on a separate scorecard, even if you're smaller. Uh, but as you scale, the more lagging stuff can stay because you can control it by making it leading on somebody else's scorecard. All right, here we go. A scorecard is a series of measurable activities that are tracked on a weekly basis. It is comprehensive, but not overwhelming. 
helps you put your finger on the pulse of the business is reviewed weekly with your leadership team. And someone is accountable for each measurable leading indicators whenever possible. Target levels set for a good, not a superstar employee. Green is green, red for hit, not hit. Eventually, every department has their own scorecard. Uh, and that was, I think that's, that's almost it. Okay, and then I got a QR code. If you have questions at the end, I'll put it up in a second. So a scorecard is a series of measurable activities that are tracked on a weekly basis. It's comprehensive, but not overwhelming. I favor closer to the five than the 15. Ten's a nice number, but you can see when you really net it out, you got to have those numbers on there that drive revenue, your revenue function, your finance function, and your ops function. You got to at least have those basics where you're going to have some, you're going to have some faltering. It's funny. Companies will ask me, they'll say, I can't measure that stuff in ops. And then usually that's where they're having the problems. So I know it's not easy to figure out how to measure some stuff. You got to challenge yourself to do it. They help you put your finger on the pulse of the business. They're reviewed weekly with the leadership team. Someone's accountable for each measurable. Every single person in the company has to have a number of some kind eventually. Leading indicators never possible. Target level set for good, not superstar. Green, red, green, red for it, not hit. Eventually every department has their own scorecard. Your homework is very simple. Complete actual targets or measurables that you set. So the first step in scorecarding is just figuring out, doing that exercise I had earlier, which is that desert island thing. What do I want? If I was on a desert island, what would I want to see in my business at every level of the company? I'd want to see these five things. Just write it down. Just start tracking that. Don't say, well, Eric said, blah, blah. Forget what Eric said. Just start tracking anything on a weekly basis. Write down someone's name. Write down a measurable, write down a goal for the week, put 13 weeks on account on a on a scorecard, on an Excel sheet, whatever, and start measuring for, for 90 days. That's it. Just start. And then as it as it evolves, ask yourself, are these numbers actually allowing us to hit our targets? Specifically, usually revenue and profitability. I want you to start tracking them weekly, revisit them every 90 days. And if you need help at all in any shape, fashion, or form, call us. We scan that QR code. Uh which is on your deck and you can scan it here if you want. Uh, we will help you. We'll set you up with somebody to help you. All right. That was about uh, 10 years of information in a very short period of time. We have a lot of people here. Does anybody have any questions? I'll, put the, I'll leave the QR card on here. Anybody have any questions? There's a question in the chat that Mark put in earlier, if you want to address that one. All right. You want to read it to me, Nicolette, please? Yeah. Um, it says, if it's a consistent issue, at what point would you intervene? At what point uh, What point do I intervene? At what point do you intervene? Yeah. Um, so I think your question, Mark, is, I, th I think I'm going to answer this question the right way. If I don't think this, I meaning the leader of a department, so I'm putting my department leader hat on. If I don't think a, that there's a plan in place to make a number uh, green at a point that I'm okay with the timeline, I'm going to intervene right away. And usually I'm going to say, uh, what, what do we need? I ask them, do you have the right resources you need? Do you have everything you need to do this job? Do you think we have the process set up right that you're actually doing? Do you think we have the number right? I have a conversation taking my own accountability first as the leader, uh, assuming that maybe it's something the company's doing wrong. So I ask all those questions. What can we do to help you? And then depending on what those answers are, I say, well, we need a plan to make this green. If you're confident in it, I, I'm more definitive. So the more definitive I am once the, the measurements evolve, if I'm, if I'm confident in that measurable, I'm going to say, mm, I'm pretty confident in this. And then I will look at them and I'll say, do they need more training? Um, I tend to be sympathetic. So I'll, I, I'll, I, do I can, can I give them more training? But then I ask myself in a different tool, I'll say, is this the right person or not? Or maybe they're in the wrong seat. But ultimately, if there's a plan, they're not getting it done and they have the right resources, uh, we tend to make changes pretty quickly in those circumstances. Um, but if they don't have a plan, and we're going to make sure they have a plan soon. Now, we have a lot of red on our scorecard. Uh, I shouldn't say that. We have some red on our scorecard, not a lot. But where we have red, my leadership team and I and our other teams in the company have plans to address the issue, and they are timelined. So if those timelines don't address that issue, we're going we're gonna to look at it again until we, until we get it right again. And sometimes we, we think that we learn that we're wrong, which is why I don't just start by yelling at the employees like I used to 10 years ago. Now I just say, okay, well, maybe that's the wrong metric. 
but there's degrees, you know, webinar number three coming soon right on scorecard. There's degrees of confidence that I have in certain numbers in the company. Um, Brendan's probably chuckling because, you know, our CRO, because he knows this is true. There are degrees to which we, if we're not confident it's the right number or the right measurable, we tend to take a more investigative approach. We tend to be like, hmm, well, we think that they're supposed to be doing that. And uh, we think we should kind of press on them, uh, but we're not as sure. So we kind of press and then listen. And then there are measurables where we are very sure where we just say, look, this is the way it is. And you have your measurements. We're, we'll do whatever we can to help. But ultimately, we know that this, this measurement in, in, is the right one. And if that team member can't do it, we, we move them on usually. I hope that answered your question. Other questions? Dark, uh, Dark has his hand raised. Mr. Muhammad. Hey, Eric. Um, first, to thank you, and then maybe just a shared experience to the degree it's it's relevant for, for everybody else here. Uh, the scorecard process that you've helped us with has, has been totally transformational for our business. It's taken four or five years because I'm a slow learner. But to your point, uh, to your point, it definitely took us 18 to 24 months to really get it nailed down. And you know what what you were alluding to. So there's a, a bunch of different facets to our business. Certainly we have a biz dev facet to the business, but also like delivering what we promise to our clients is really important. And eventually we landed on, look, if, if we just make sure that clients are meeting with us on the cadence that, uh, that we commit to, then all the other things that we commit to will happen. All the financial planning, all the follow-ups that, that we need to do to make sure our process is happening correctly. So what we did was we have two scorecard metrics for um, our service folks, and it's uh, making sure that there's a line. No more than 10% of clients at any point in time can be not scheduled for their next meeting, which drives the meetings. And then we have a 90-day no contact standard. So we want to be in touch with all of our clients at least every 90 days no more than 20% of our clients can be uh, over 90 days of being contacted. So, you know, once we figured out what those thresholds were and then just holding the people that, that work directly with these clients to schedule them and provide their service to have them track that single metric has been just really transformational. So, you know, last thing I'll say, we measure client retention as, as one of our key metrics overall organizationally. And I think this process has led us to have that over 99% uh, client retention every year. So uh, it's a pure testament to the scorecard metrics and it, it took us a long time to get there, but uh, yeah, wanted it, to say thank you again. Uh, you're very welcome. And I'm glad we have so many people that have stayed on for this entire thing, which is uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for. So team, I want you all to think about this. Okay. So a lot of learning here, a lot of learning I've done from all of you, honestly, and some of our companies that have really scaled uh, rapidly and large. Um, if you, if you work, think about the companies that you idolize and that you love, uh, and I can make a list. They're usually the combination of some kind of marketing strategy, like they have a strategy in the market. Okay. Like I'll, 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 I'll pick, I'll pick Amazon. It's an easy target, uh, or Apple or any of the, any of the generic stuff. Those companies have grown because they have this market facing strategy, uh, different webinar, but they, they also have key things that they measure in the space that embody their entire strategy. So like if, if Amazon is, Amazon is really only a scorecard. Amazon is a scorecard strategy company. That's their entire, uh, their entire strategy is, is how many products can we have? Uh, how much can we price them at? And how fast can we get, can we get them to purchase transactions? How fast can we, make the, can we allow, how fast can a consumer get a, a transaction done on our website? And then how fast can we get them the product? That's it. That's how you get Amazon. That's why you like it. Because they identified that in the market, if they could have most variety uh, with competitive pricing where stuff can arrive, apparently these days, the second you hit a button, which is freaky, and they can, and you can buy it by clicking a button. I think they even know your credit card the minute it shows up in your mail these days. Then they've won. So you can go to all the companies you do business with, and you can think about it and say, this company is probably tracking the following measurements inside this business. And I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. I'll take another question if you have about four minutes left here. You probably read our blog on Disney's um, uh, drop plates. 
Um, I'm a big Disney fan. As all you know, I love Disney for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is they were running such an amazing company. Now they have some issues now, so we could argue and have a great conversation about that. But uh, the Drop Plate blog, if you haven't read it, it's a fascinating one because I was at Alani uh, in Disney in Hawaii. It's a phenomenal resort if you have ever a chance to go. And Disney's known for you can never see behind the scenes of anything unless you pay like a gazillion dollars to actually see behind the scenes. And I, th- I then I still think you're actually going to fake behind the scenes at that point. But I got an opportunity there to see a real behind the scenes thing 100% by accident once. I was walking from the pool area back to our hotel and I walked past this door to what I learned was their kitchen area. Now, Disney does nothing is, is in, in pure sight that you can see that they don't want you to see. So there was the door and then there was another door behind that. And for this very split second, both doors were open and it allowed me to see inside the kitchen. On the kitchen was a big whiteboard. And on the whiteboard was one word. It said dropped plates and it had a number next to it. And, and then the doors closed. So maybe there was a couple more very, very measurables on there. I have no idea. But the point is that Disney decided, probably in a lot of ways, if you just measure how many plates they drop in a day, if they don't drop plates, that encompasses a lot of different things that they were dealing with probably as an issue. So they just put on a whiteboard and wrote a number next to it. That's an example of saying, if nothing else, if we nail this, we nail everything else. Walmart's got that with their greeters. If we can make sure they, they greet every single customer without fail, we now have a greeting strategy. Think about that. Their scorecard for that greeter uh, is that they need to talk to every single person. Nobody can be missed. That's a scorecard item. They nail that and they are known for that item. So think about your business when you leave here. What are the scorecard items that we should be tracking that encompass the things that are going to make our customers love us, make our business grow, and make us money? Those are the three areas you want to focus on. Anybody have one last question? We actually added people to this room. There are 50 people here now. You have two questions in the chat. Okay, go ahead, Nicolette. Um, this one's from FJM. It said, what would be a good start for a logistics company? Oh, Brendan, we have logistic companies. We probably do. Um, uh, okay. So you're all you're going to be all about probably speed, load. Um, okay. You know what a good start for you is? I'm not kidding you. Is uh, scan the QR code and sit with uh, anybody on our team, and we'll figure out your numbers in an hour, at least your first pass. And I promise you won't try to sell you anything. Uh, Brendan, just, we'll, just ping us. We'll figure out what your numbers are. We'll get you on your first pass anyway, and then so you can iterate from there. Uh, but you're probably looking at at something like speed. You got to you got to follow speed. I would think um, you're going to have to follow uh, probably track something like um, load and and space in these trucks. I'm guessing you have to measure efficiency uh, what you pack in there. Uh, there's probably a few, um, but I bet you in that business you only have five or six. Uh, and actually, um, I'm very good friends with a person who runs a logistics company, Brendan. So if this comes across you, I'll connect them with that person, and they probably will share the logistics scorecard with you. Other question? One more in the chat from Charles. It says, why do you give yourself a B in Cruise & Co? What is it you feel is missing? This has got to be Charles Anton. Is this Charles Anton? Yes. <laughs> ah! Always giving me a hard time. Yeah, there he is. He's on camera, too. By the way, I bought 12 boxes of Girl Scout cookies from your daughter. Yes. Yes. I'm not going to go any further into that story. They're amazing. So uh, why do I give our scorecard a B? All right. Brendan's like, don't do it. Don't do it. Here's why. Okay, this is it. This is our scorecard. Okay. So there are 20 variables on here. One. I don't like. There are we are a mix of departmental and leading, which I don't like. Uh, it's not always red and green, which I really don't like. Um, but so you might think, well, Eric, you should do better than that. Hey, I'm not a hypocrite. I always show you any of our numbers. We're about a four to five million dollar business. Our finance function is relatively new, a couple of years old. There's been a million two right now. We're still trying to get this in place. If you rush scorecard and you don't start with the basics and allow yourself to fail, then um, you can't get it right. Uh, I would say in six, 12 months, we're going to have to knock off five or six of these things. And then we're going to start making sure these are scorecard at the next level down. Now, I know our CRO is probably already going to sit here working on this now that I've shown you all this. But this is a combination of departmental stuff, leading stuff, 
And we're, we're doing it because we're not sure about some of this stuff yet. And we're tracking it. But I guarantee you, as if you come to our inversion three of this in six or 12 months, this is going to shrink because the picture gets clearer on this stuff. And as the picture gets clearer, the number of stuff drops. And it's because your strategy and what you're focusing on gets clearer. And that's why. There you go, Brendan. I'll turn it off now. That's why it's a B. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Well, I really appreciate all of you staying here for all this time. Uh, unless none of you are here and your phones are on and you're just wandering around the house with the screen off, that's also possible. Oh, this many people, I actually kind of doubt that. Um, so I'll just end by saying you have our code. We will promise not to try and sell you anything. So don't, it's not one of those false things. Uh, we were volunteers for many, many, many years before we started doing any of this for any money. So we just wanted to make sure you're covered. You have our code. You reach out to us at any time. We'll help you with your scorecard. I'd rather have you failing early and getting it done so you can iterate from there. Other than that, I'm very grateful for all the clients that are here. And if you're not a client, uh, we'd love to work with you. But either way, uh, good luck on your entrepreneurial journey. It's a gift. So thank you all for coming. It's been a joy.